This episode is brought to you by Raycon Wireless Earbuds. What is going on Solo fam? My name is John Solo and today we're talking about one of the world's most famous nursery rhymes with a shockingly disturbing origin story, London Bridge. I mean, it's not as disturbing as Fergie's use of the nursery rhyme, but it's pretty damn close. Chances are, if you're watching this video, then you've heard this classic song. Maybe you've even sung it yourself while playing the game at recess or gym class. After all, the lyrics and melody are pretty easy to remember. London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. London Bridge is falling down, my fair lady. But have you ever stopped and asked yourself what London Bridge is falling down was actually inspired by? Or why the bridge was falling down so often? Or why a fair lady had anything to do with anything? Whether you have or not, I'm sure you're wondering now, which is good because that's exactly what we're talking about today. In addition to sharing the various versions of the song from across time and around the world, we'll also be discussing some theories about what those lyrics could possibly be referring to. As always, make sure you hit that like button before we get started, as well as subscribe for new content just like this on a regular basis basis, and now let's dive into the messed up origins of London Bridge. So I don't know about you, but despite knowing of this song's existence my entire life, I had no idea there were more lyrics than the four lines I just said. Because in addition to simply telling the fair lady that London Bridge is falling down, the person singing it explains why rebuilding it with certain materials just won't work. Build it up with wooden clay, wooden clay, wooden clay. Build it up with wooden clay, my fair lady. Wooden clay will wash away, wash away, wash away. Wooden clay will wash away, my fair lady. So wooden clay is the first suggestion but there's quite a few more. I'm not gonna sing the whole thing as much as you guys may want me to, but the words that are in italics are the ones that are repeated three times, just like in the last verses. Build it up with bricks and mortar. Bricks and mortar will not stay. Build it up with iron and steel. Iron and steel will bend and bow. Build it up with silver and gold. Silver and gold will be stolen away. Set a man to watch all night. Suppose the man should fall asleep. Give him a pipe to smoke all night. And then of course, the final line, my fair lady. So those are the full lyrics of the English version of the song. And I I personally had no idea it was that long. Another fun fact I was completely oblivious to is that London Bridge is actually a game. I don't know how I wasn't aware of that. I must have missed the Barney episode where they played it. So basically what happens is two players make a bridge with raised arms and the other players pass through in a line, each hoping not to be caught by the falling arms of the first two players. When their arms do fall, the player that's caught inside is trapped while they sing a new verse, take the key and lock her up, my fair lady. Now as for why we're locking people up, I'll give you the terrifying explanation in the next section, but first let's talk a little more about where the song came from and other versions around the world. Interestingly, many folklore experts have come to the same conclusion, that London Bridge in its original form was around sometime during the Middle Ages, meaning between 1100 and 1453. However, the first time the full lyrics were published in English wasn't until 1744 in a book called Tommy Thumb's Pretty Songbook. As you can see, the lyrics are mostly the same, only instead of falling down, it says broken down, and my fair lady is replaced with dance over my lady Lee and with a gay lady. Also, they replace the materials of wood and clay and bricks and mortar with gravel and stone, which will also wash away. Now, since that publication, there have been numerous other versions found in other countries. Unfortunately, we don't have the dates of their earliest publications, nor do we know if the melody of these songs is the exact same, but we do know they were sung while playing the same game, as you can kind of tell while reading the lyrics. That's how we know they're connected. So in France, they have the drawbridge and Alave Bouvet, which go as follows. Three times, shall pass, the last, the last. Three times shall pass, the last will stay. What beautiful daughters you have, Olive Bouvet. What beautiful daughters you have, on the night's bridge. If you catch, I'll give you one, Olive Bouvet. If you catch, I'll give you one, on the night's bridge. Now in Germany, there's the Magdeburger Bridge and the Golden Bridge. I wanted to go over the Bridge of Magdeburg. It's broken. Who broke it? The goldsmith, the goldsmith, with his youngest daughter. Let's rebuild it. Using what? Using what? Chains and rods. Get everyone across. Get everyone across. We will catch the last one. I will have it rebuilt. Using what? A ring of pearls and stone of gold. What do you give me as a pledge? The hindmost that you can catch. Shout out to solo fan members Catherine and Sarah for those respective translations, and also for having the same names as two of my three sisters, but spelled different. So it kind of sucks that I can't give you guys the exact dates of when these songs were written, so we're not 100% sure which came first or how they influenced each other. But I'm sure at this point you're noticing a trend. All of these songs talk about bridges in various states of disrepair, as well as catching one of the people going across. Once again, we can't say exactly why that's a key part of every song, but when you find out the leading theory behind it, it's pretty much impossible to forget. 
Yeah, London Bridge might be about human sacrifice. I'm sorry I'm the one who had to tell you. Now, to be completely honest, I'm usually pretty skeptical about explanations like this. They remind me of the crappy pastas and cartoon conspiracy theories from back in the day that try way too hard to be spoopy. But the reason I give this one any credit is that folklorists Iona and Peter Ropey, who were also a skeptical pair, mentioned it as a real possibility in their book, The Oxford Dictionary of Nursery Rhymes. That being said, their primary resource for this theory, James Frazier, has received a lot of criticism for embellishing his sources and making them more morbid than necessary. Regardless, I at least wanted to briefly discuss this theory because it's very popular. So basically, Frazier said in his book, The Golden Bough, that earlier generations of humans would make sacrifices to the gods when constructing bridges because they believed that would stop them from collapsing. But these weren't your regular old sacrifices. Living people had to be sealed into the bridge's foundation. One of the examples he gave is the Bridge of Arta in Greece, which has been rebuilt numerous times over the centuries and supposedly wouldn't stay standing until the Master Mason's wife was sealed inside. I don't know, man. To me, it just sounds like the Master Mason wanted to get rid of his wife and needed a way to make sure she would stay out of his life forever. And if that was the case... Good thinking, Lincoln. Another example he gave was a four-year-old boy who was supposedly encased in the foundation of the Bridge of Rosborden in Brittany. My only problem with that, and really all of the examples he gives, is that the bridges were built and demolished so long ago that I can't find anything about them online. So it's impossible for me or anyone else to confirm that human remains were indeed found inside after they were demolished. Again, I'm not writing off this theory completely because it does fit oddly well with the lyrics. I mean, every verse suggests a new material and the verse that follows says what the problem with that material will be. Be. To me, it almost sounds like the fair lady is pleading with someone to not seal her child in the foundation and is suggesting alternate ways to make the bridge more stable, like using iron and steel. Combine that with the game where a child is trapped between two people's arms where the shape even kind of resembles a pillar, it almost seems too perfect. Unfortunately, it's just the fact that we can't confirm that human sacrifices were really made for bridge construction back then that makes me doubt it. That's a big piece of the puzzle to be missing, and I saw way too many websites and books touting this theory as fact for me to not make that clear. Worry not though, because there's a few other potential explanations that, while not as depressing, are just as interesting. So there's another rendition of London Bridge that I haven't mentioned yet because it pertains to a specific theory, that Vikings were responsible for it falling down. There's an old collection of stories about Norwegian kings written by Snorri Sturluson in 1230 called Heimskingla. And before you Viking enthusiasts even bother to comment, I am very aware that I butchered those names. The point is though, that collection included a poem about King Olaf II of Norway destroying London Bridge in the year 1014. The English translation, written by Samuel Lang in 1844, goes as follows. Follows. London Bridge is broken down, gold is won in bright renown, shields resounding, war horns sounding, hild is shouting in the din, arrows singing, mail coats ringing, Odin makes our Olaf win. Now before you get too excited, the original verse was not written in that melody and format. Samuel Lang purposely mirrored the style of London Bridges falling down with the intention of making the Old Norse poems more memorable and accessible for the people of that day. That being said, it is very interesting that there's a written record of the bridge being broken down hundreds of years before the English lyrics that we're familiar with were published. I would say it's worth mentioning this is the only record of that event that's been found, so there is a chance the author is either embellishing or even spitting straight fiction, but the timeline does fit. It supposedly happened right at the start of the Middle Ages, which is when folklorists believe the London Bridge game was invented. Now this last theory is definitely the least flashy, but in my opinion, fits the lyrics very well. For those who don't know, the first great stone bridge was built across the River Thames in Britain in 1176. And as you might imagine what happened with the first stone bridge of this size, its design was nowhere near perfect and it went through some serious maintenance on more than one occasion. The first time was actually because of what was built on it. When the bridge was finally finished in 1209, it became the choice spot for both commercial and residential purposes. But only three years after its completion, a massive fire destroyed all of the houses and businesses that were built on it and 3,000 people were killed. You would think that would serve as a signal to the Brits that maybe they shouldn't be stacking so many buildings on top of each other, but nah, they were all immediately rebuilt and life went on as normal. Over 70 years later, in 1282, five of the bridge's pillars collapsed from the pressure of winter ice, but the bridge itself remained standing and those pillars were rebuilt. Then, almost 500 years later, some more construction was done with the intention of making the bridge, which at this 
this point was showing some serious signs of deterioration stronger. They replaced two of the central arches with one big arch, but this idea backfired because it led to serious erosion from the river and gravel having to constantly be poured in to protect the bridge's remaining piers. In other words, London Bridge was breaking down, breaking down, breaking down, and eventually maintenance became too much of a hassle, so a new bridge was built in 1831, with the original being demolished the following year. Fun fact, that newer bridge also went on to be replaced, and after being dismantled, was brought over to Arizona, where it still stands to this day and where I'll be standing in just a couple of days. Now, like I said, in my opinion, these events fit the lyrics very well. The bridge is constantly undergoing maintenance because it's falling apart and different solutions are being suggested. And what really stands out to me is that unlike the other theories, there's a possible explanation for why, after rejecting the ideas of using iron, steel, gold, silver, etc., having a person watch over the bridge seems to be the solution. I'm obviously just spitballing here, but to me, it sounds like the song could be a discussion of how to avoid future calamities like the great fire that took place only only a few years after the bridge was built. Making the bridge stronger sounds like a good idea at first, but what's really needed is someone to stand guard and warn the people on the bridge that danger is afoot, whether that's a fire or the pillars underneath collapsing. The only real problem I can think of with that interpretation is that it doesn't take into consideration the game where somebody gets trapped, but maybe there's a version where the person isn't trapped per se, but rather selected to be the watchman? Probably not. I'm most likely just trying to cram a square peg into a round hole, but to a certain extent, isn't that what all these theories are doing? So now that we have some ideas about where London Bridge could have come from, I want to quickly talk about the possible identity of the Fair Lady. Keep in mind that these theories are even less substantiated than the ones about where the song came from, but I still feel like they're worth mentioning. The first theory, which I think is basic and lame, is the Virgin Mary. People say that her birthday was on September 8th, the day the Vikings destroyed the London Bridge, and it's because of her protection that they couldn't take the city. The next is Matilda of Scotland, Henry I's wife who was responsible for building a series of bridges that carried the London Colchester Road across across the River Lee. Third is Eleanor of Provence. She was King Henry III's wife who had custody of the bridge revenues from 1269 to roughly 1281. People have made this connection because she was attacked with eggs and stones at London Bridge by frustrated citizens as her boat tried passing underneath. And last is a member of the Lee family of Stone Lee Park, whose coat of arms you can see on your screen. They claim that one of their very own family members lies under the bridge's foundation and was inspiration for the line, dance over my Lady Lee. Now just to reiterate, I personally think that all of those theories are grasping at straws, but I am curious to hear what you guys think. Not just about the fair lady's identity, of course, but also the origin of the nursery rhyme. Which theory do you believe or just find the most interesting? Let me know in a comment down below. And while you're doing that, let me tell you about this week's sponsor, Raycon. Listen, I know we just spent this entire episode talking about nursery rhymes, but I listen to way more music than that. There's also lullabies and theme songs from 80s TV shows. And whenever I'm jamming out but don't want to make Lauren or even worse, Gunther feel bad about my superior taste in music, I pop in my Raycon Everyday E25s. For those unaware, Raycons are the wireless earbuds that have been taking the market by storm since their release, and it's easy to see why. For one, they're literally half the price of other premium brands while maintaining amazing quality with plenty of bass, not to mention the fact that they're way more stylish than those brands with no dangling wires or stems, as well as having a noise isolating fit so you can focus on whatever you're listening to, and they come in a variety of colors. You can pick the ones that match your style best. Another incredible feature is the compact carrying case. It can store up to four full charges. That's 24 hours of listening to your favorite artists, whether that's Mother Goose or somebody else. In all seriousness though, my everyday E25s have been getting a lot of miles put on them throughout the packing process these past few weeks. It's stressful, but getting to listen to my podcasts and audiobooks throughout the process has made it a lot more enjoyable. And again, that enjoyment comes at half the cost of other competing brands. How do you beat that? Answer, you can't. So if you want to get a pair for yourself, go to buyraycon.com solo or follow my link in the description to get an extra 15% off your order. And on that note, Solo fam, I'm going to wrap this episode up. Thank you all so much for watching, especially if you made it to this point. Now, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more messed up content on a weekly basis. As you can tell from the lack of, you know, pretty much anything behind me, I'm actually in the middle of getting ready to move to one of COVID-19's favorite states, Arizona. With that in mind, I do still have some messed up content planned for next week, but it's not in the form that you'd expect. So keep an eye out for the launch of our new series, Messed Up Minute. I really think you're gonna love it. And if you wanna tune into our incredible journey across the states, I'm not exactly a travel vlogger, but I will be keeping you guys updated via social media, so make sure to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Also follow Gunther too, because he's gonna be stuck in his car seat for about three days and he might need some DMs to slide into to stay entertained. Isn't that right, Bubba? You said you got some pickup lines you want to try out? Yeah.
That's what I thought. That's what you told me, right? Is that what you told me? Once again, I'll be seeing y'all next week with our first official episode of Messed Up Minute. Until that day comes, though, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. Thank you.